our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thursday morning, uh, we our synod assembly started on Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon actually, and so I was kind of taking it easy. Thursday morning, getting ready, packing to be awake for three days. And I casually opened my email on my cell phone and found that the deans, of which I am one, were to be at the Senate Assembly at 11 o'clock instead of 1 o'clock, <laughs> which kind of moved my timetable up a little bit. And I thought, oh man, it was 9.30. I was going out to Melville. I'll do the math for you. It's about an hour and a half. So now I'm like, oh man, I got to get there because we were rehearsing for our role in the worship service. So I get in the car. It was a red car day, so I got in the red car, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting God. I want you to know I'm trusting God. I'm like, okay, God, if you want me to get there at 11 o'clock, I'm, I'm going to try and drive appropriately. And I got on the LIE. Yeah, amen, right? Amen. Oh, not the LIE. Right. And all of a sudden, traffic gets all jammed up. Okay, okay. Some, this is the way it is in the life of faith, right? Okay, God, I'm trusting you. And it turns out that the reason the traffic got backed up for a little bit was because there was a there was a help vehicle on the side of the road with its lights on. That's all. That's all. It was a help vehicle on the side of the road. And, and everybody had to slow down to look at that vehicle and go, ooh. <laughs> another car there. There wasn't a car on fire. Thank God. There wasn't anybody hurt. There were no ambulances. It was just a help vehicle on the side of the road with the lights. And I, I, you know, so I'm trying to trust God that I'll get there on time if I have to. But I just got so frustrated that people were slowing down and go, ooh. So as soon as I was done going, ooh, I was like, come on, people. What are you doing? Because you need your chance, because you waited in line, right? You waited in line. Ooh, okay, come on. I've had my opportunity here. We're funny, aren't we, people? Aren't we funny? You have to laugh. Believe me, I, you have to laugh, because the alternative isn't so great. You'll go nuts otherwise. What is it about us, though? What is it about us that we just love to, like, spectate at stuff? I guess, maybe some of you are more, um, more actively engaged, but we just, we want to see stuff. We want to look. We want to just stop and, and kind of take it in and go, oh, that's interesting, and then move on. Important also. We don't want to be caught up in whatever it is that's going on. We want to be able to move on from it. We want to get our chance to look and then keep going. Um, over the centuries, we kind of don't change much, right? They're the disciples, and, and they've spent all this time with Jesus, and they've witnessed the resurrection. Keep that in mind. This is, this is the book of Acts. The, gospels, the gospel stories have reached their, their wonderful climax in the resurrection of Jesus, and now it's what do we do next with this revelation that, that we have been given? And so Jesus says, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to share the good news. I want you to tell other people about this earth-shaking reality that has come to presence through me and therefore through you. Um, and I want you to pray about that. And instead, the disciples, just like I said to the kids, the disciples are like, ooh. Like, we just love going, ooh. But Jesus says, no, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. And it's through doing that work that we better experience the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're saying to yourself, you know, that's nice, Pastor Paul, but I don't really know that I've ever felt the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I doubt that many of you are saying that. You probably have felt the power of the Holy Spirit and you just haven't been able to label it the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be together in community. So that other people can say, oh, I know what that was. Can we do this for one another? That was the Holy Spirit. That was God intervening in your life. And sometimes we don't see that right away. But other people need to point out to us that right there where we might have missed it was the presence of God. And then we can go, oh, yeah. 
I was so stuck in the middle of that situation, so caught up in my own anxieties or thoughts or preoccupations, that I didn't notice that God was active in my life then. That's why we need one another. That's why we are gathered together in community, so that we can, we can help one another reflect on the places where God is intervening in our lives. That's why we're together as community. I have a great deal of respect for people who say that they can worship God on their own. That's also part of our responsibility, right? Our relationship with God is one that we, that we nurture and cultivate on our own, but also find strength for it in community. But there has to be that give and take of, of a personal prayer life and then a corporate worship life. That's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, what happens is if we're only engaged in the personal prayer life, if we have that like very focused prayer life, often that can go off in the wrong direction. We can start thinking that we're hearing God speak to us, which may be true, but how do you know it's God if you don't have anybody to check that out with? And so we can go off in the wrong direction. We've seen that happen time and time again in history. Why are you doing these terrible things? Because God told me to do them. Really? Did anybody tell you that God doesn't talk that way? No, I wasn't listening to anybody else. I'm doing my own thing. On the other hand, if all we have is the corporate gathering, if all we do is gather once a week for this time of worship, our life of faith becomes a one-week shot or a respite where we get out of life, right? We come here for an hour or an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes or two hours. <laughs> we come here for a certain amount of time on a Sunday morning and what happens is we get inside the doors and we kind of walk in the doors of the church and we're like, oh, okay. You know, this hour, this time of peace and quiet. Maybe we'll sing some favorite hymns today, please God. Maybe we'll sing some of the good ones. Um, and we'll hear, hopefully we'll hear a good message. We'll see people we like. And then we we'll go back out. We kind of like... It's almost like you go into your hour and a half of training, and then you get back out into the world for another, to be battered around for the, for the week, and, and to sort of do your own thing, and then you come back here and go, oh. but I don't, that's not the whole of corporate worship, right? So if all we have of our faith life is just that, that time of corporate worship once a week, um, except in the summer when you're, when you're on vacation, then what happens is there's no connection to the other six days and 23 hours. It becomes this little oasis that doesn't really have an impact because we're, we're limiting God to this one special time of the week. And God, the reality of our faith tells us that God is there all the time. And if we're open to that, you know, if we cultivate both the individual and the corporate, then we'll see how those two work together to make us stronger followers of Jesus, which is, which is what we're here for. That's what we're here for. I don't, you know, maybe you came for different reasons today. And whatever gets you here, you know, whatever gets you up in the morning, whatever brings you to church, we call out the Holy Spirit. But the goal of our gathering, of being fed on word and sacrament, is so that we can be better followers of Jesus. In other words, we don't come together on a Sunday morning to take an hour or so and go, we come together on Sunday morning so we can do exactly what the disciples were told to do, which is to get the message, to remember who we are and to whom we belong, to feel the strength of God's presence in and through one another, and then to get out there, having experienced that love in new and powerful ways, and share the good news. Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses. And he says that to us as well. You know, just like the kids said, what do we do while we're waiting for Jesus to come again? We don't hoard things. We don't hoard our faith. We share it. And by sharing it, it becomes stronger. I want you to try that. I don't mean now. I mean during the week. Find opportunities to share your faith. Whatever that means. It's going to be different for each of us. Maybe that means meeting somebody or, or interacting with somebody at work or somebody in your family who's having a hard time and tell them, I'm praying for you. Which you probably, probably many of you do. I'm praying for you and I'm praying that God will lift the burden off your shoulders. 
And if you find some receptivity to that, this gets scary, but, but you know, the power comes from God and not from us. Offer to pray with them then and there. How about that? Now, for some of you, that's scary. Okay? Two things. One, maybe you have to practice. Two, maybe it's not your gift. Different gifts for different people. Some people are really good prayers. Have you met people like that? They just pray really well, and they make you feel connected to God. Other people are just good. I was reading um, in our book study on Tuesday evening, we were reading about a man, a Quaker, who went into a severe depression. The person that made the most difference in his life was the person who simply came and sat with him. And said nothing. Said nothing. Just sat with him. It was a ministry of presence. And you can do that too. And sometimes that's how God corrects you in your life of faith. But it's a matter of, as, as we were singing just before, to humble ourselves and let God work through us without thinking we need to have the agenda ahead of time. So, so we make ourselves available to God to do all kinds of things. To pray, to sit with others. Um, one of the things that uh, Emmanuel is so good at, we are so good at as a congregation, and I thank God for it, is that, that spirit of generosity. As, as the leadership of your church, sometimes we're afraid that you're going to get donor fatigue. Now we're going to ask you to support the Bronx Youth Mission and um, our sister's place and Tanzania and the malaria campaign and world hunger and bread for the world and I mean you name it we, we could go on and on right and maybe you do get donor fatigue maybe you've been all that stuff that we're asking you you're like oh again I didn't really come to church this morning to be asked again for money you have to remember that we, we, when we as the church ask you we're not we're not telling you we're asking you right? we're giving you an opportunity to practice your faith so if you come walking in the doors and there's a board in the back that says, please donate X, Y, and Z to, um, to the women's shelter, and you're like, oh, then don't do it. Don't do it, really, because the Holy Spirit is not guiding you to do that. But I would encourage you to pray about that first, because it's supposed to be an opportunity for you to practice your faith and not an obligation or a responsibility or a burden on you. Because here's one of the ways you know that God is active in something. Small or large, there's some joy in it. Right? Small or large, there's some joy in it. That's how you find the presence of God. So if we're asking you to do something, and your response to that is one of aggravation and frustration, then God is not leading you to be part of that. I'm assuming that you prayed about it first, and you didn't just go, like, here's another piece of junk, and you're asking me for money. So all these things are designed to help us practice our discipleship to get out of ourselves and to let the Holy Spirit work through us so that we can experience in turn a stronger faith. Sometimes the reason our faith isn't strong is because we don't exercise it. We don't practice it. We don't put it on the line. A warning here as your spiritual coach. When you walk into the gym of the life of faith, don't walk right up to the 250-pound barbell, okay? <laughs> you will hurt yourself. And then you will say, oh, I'm never doing that again. Start small. Start with what the Holy Spirit offers to you. If you're on Facebook every day, we'll post some Bible readings that um, you can look at. Look at one of them. And see how God is speaking to you through that. If you bring home the little devotional, let that be a way for you to start getting yourself into a daily practice of trying to be open to God's word. If it works, great. If it doesn't, drop the barbell, okay? Do something else. If it starts to hurt too bad, it's not going to... I know the saying is no pain, no gain. A little bit of pain, a little bit of gain. We don't want to do it all at once, right? You can't have the whole meal all at once. You can't run through the gym, lifting up everything, and then never go back. We're in this for the long haul, right? That's God's vision. We're in this life of faith for the long haul. I feel like I can speak to you about that with some authority. Because I've been in this for 30 years. I was going to say I had a lot more hair than I actually didn't. It was just in different places. <laughs> when I was first ordained, before I got ordained, hopefully this will give you a chuckle. 
As I thought about what I wanted as an ordained person, the goal was that someday I would become bishop. This is where you laugh, okay? This is where you just, just hold your sides and go, because I was actually offering to pay people not to put me down as bishop. But I had my goals set pretty high, which is fine. Until I realized that that's not where the Spirit was guiding me. And if my goal was still to be the bishop after 30 years, I might be a little disappointed. I say this to you as a witness of God's power. I am not disappointed. I am not disappointed. I am so grateful for the way that God has accomplished things through me, but then never just through me, but through us together. Anytime I go to practice ministry, you all are with me as the body of Christ gathered together that, that gives me the strength and the courage and the enthusiasm to do what I do. If I invite people to come here to worship, why do I do that? Because I know that here they will find great community. Our bishop yesterday said that what people need, I think it was our bishop, our bishop said that what people need is to feel care. That was, right? What they need is to feel care. They're coming out of a world that knows nothing of Jesus, knows very little of comfort, knows very little of community, unfortunately, especially in our area. And when they come to worship, what they want to feel is that people care about them, that they recognize in them another child of God. And I really have great confidence that when people come here, hopefully that's what they experience. I feel like they do. Oh, can we be better at that? Of course. Do we celebrate what God is able to accomplish through us? Absolutely. To have strength and confidence in the fact that, that people who come here to worship will feel the presence of God, not just through the words, but through you. Through your words of invitation and grace and peace to one another. And, and so, I share with you that we're in this for the long haul. That we grow slowly. I want to um, finally close with this, which, which kind of struck me in a powerful way as I was reading through John's Gospel. This, in John's Gospel, the 17th chapter, this is the only place where we find a definition of what eternal life is. Think about that for a moment. If, if you were to define eternal life, what would it be? Immediately, maybe you think of clouds, heaven, bright light. This is what Jesus says. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. There's nothing futuristic about it, right? It's very present. That they may know you, the only true God, now. And that knowledge, again, like we've been talking about for weeks, is not head knowledge. Oh, I know. It's not acquaintance. Oh, I know of God, but it's a knowledge of I know God. I felt God's power in my life. I've, I've been moved and transformed by God. I felt God supporting me, upholding me, and giving me direction and guidance. That's what he says. He says that's eternal life. Right now we experience eternal life, which is out of space and time, because we feel rooted in that eternity of God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That we know those things, and that gives us that wonderful blessing of, of, of eternal life and a sense of rootedness in who God is. And we then, by sharing that with others, participate in, in that reality more fully. So, sisters and brothers, we have work to do. It's not our work, it's God's work. It's wonderful work. Um, in 1 Peter, that Akimoto read to us this morning is one of my favorite passages. Peter says, cast all your anxieties on him. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We've got work to do, but that work is joyful work. That work is fulfilling work. That work is wonderful work. And by the grace of God, we will keep it going because we humble ourselves. God lifts us up. And that, that is eternal life. Amen.